Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Today, we are joined by Radhika Rao, our specialist on all things India, to talk about her flagship report on investing in India's debt and currency markets. We will proceed the normal way we go ahead with these webinars, where Radhika will walk us through a series of slides, after which I will ask her a few questions. So Radhika, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Temur. Um, we've also just published a primer document to accompany this webinar. Um, uh, so while I touch upon uh, many of the overview points, I think the details can be found uh, uh, in the document, uh, which will be available in our research tab on the website. Uh, so let me quickly go into uh, the presentation. Uh, slide two is where um, I highlight the outline that we're going to follow over the next 15, 20 minutes. I'll begin by laying the ground uh, with respect to India's uh, fiscal public debt and ratings. Uh, follow that with highlights of the domestic bond markets and how it has been gradually opening up uh, to the foreign investors. Uh, then on uh, no current dynamics for the debt markets, then segue into the evolving external balances, uh, currency, and where, what we think will be you know, some of the global as well as local developments uh, that will matter for the Indian rupee. So in slide three, uh, it's a bit of a back to basics. Um, India follows a federal structure uh, with the powers of the, you know, uh, with regard to the powers of the government. So it's divided between the center and the states uh, or the union territories. Uh, both run their, uh, so the center as well as the states run their respective budgets um, and revenues as well as expenditure responsibilities are divided uh, between the two. On revenues, uh, the center decides on the broad tax structure, which basically includes uh, income taxes or corporate taxes. Uh, while states decide on the local taxes uh, under their jurisdiction. Now, since the uh, GST, I mean, GST was one of the biggest um, indirect tax reform uh, that occurred in the past two, three years. So when this GST was introduced in 2017, uh, many of the indirect taxes were subsumed. Uh, so now what happens is that some of the uh, items and products uh, are subject to a state as well as a central GST is usually divided equally in terms of the rate. Um, and the, uh, apart from GST, there's also a CES, and that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, applied on the products. And these proceeds are then shared with the state uh, to honor a preset agreement. Um, so this is on the revenue side. On the expenditure side, uh, powers are also divided. Now, the center oversees the provision of uh, nationally important areas. Uh, and the states assume responsibility for local subjects, you know, things like agriculture, industry, social sector benefits, uh, particularly like health and education. Uh, apart from that, this is all there is also a concurrent list, uh, which is shared uh, by both the center and the states. And then you have the local municipal bodies, which look after the provision of uh, public utilities. So this essentially uh, is is the, uh, you know, the undercurrent or the uh, laying the ground on, on the kind of federal structure that India has. Uh, in slide four, uh, we can take an aggregate view uh, of the center and the state finances. Um, now the central government has gradually consolidated. So I hear, uh, you know, on the left is basically how the fiscal deficits have been, uh, you know, panning out. And on the right, we go to the general uh, public debt levels. So let me start with the fiscal deficits first. So the central government has uh, gradually consolidated its finances here shown in the line in black uh, with the deficit narrowing from above 6%. Uh, this was soon after the global financial crisis when number of stimulus measures had to be put. Uh, so from there, uh, the, the deficits have been gradually easing um, and you saw the you know it, it being about below 3.5 percent of GDP uh, between 2016 and 2019. Uh, now pressure has, has somewhat returned last year when deficits inched up a bit uh, because of slowing growth um, and weak revenues. Uh, now moving on to the line uh, through the line in red which is basically the states. Now the states under the FRBM, so FRBM is basically the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. Under this provision, states are mandated to keep their fiscal deficits under 3% of GSDP, uh, now barring extraordinary circumstances. Now at an aggregate level, this has seen states usually adhere to this uh, ceiling, barring years when there's been some amount of developmental spending that has been required or you're making some special support measures for ailing sectors um, that you've seen in the past four or five years. Apart from that, they have largely 
uh, stayed within this this uh, you know threshold uh if we go into the pandemic you know a pandemic has really um played havoc with the public finances uh, so you've seen that the deficits um are likely to go up this year you know, for the center as well as the states um not only because you they will have to spend more uh, to you know to provide uh, health care as well as uh, support measures but also because the revenues will get affected for states in particular um, you know their own tax collections make up about 40% of overall revenues uh, and another 40% is by you know uh, given by the center so both those um, inputs are going to get uh, you know are, are both those revenue uh, sources um, are going to be weaker and on the center level as well you know collections generally because of the shutdown and because of most businesses operating below optimal levels uh, you would see impact uh, on the revenues uh, so i think from say about uh, 7 7 and 1/2% of gdp gdp you could see c- uh, cumulative def- deficit this year uh, go up to uh, above 10% uh, our estimate is closer to 12 or 13% of gdp uh, this is the deficits and going on to the public debt levels uh, in, in your india's uh, cumulative debt levels uh, that's again center plus states um has averaged about 65 70% of gdp in the past 4 5 years now if we compare that to the west uh, to the us and to us or european countries uh, or japan uh, you know it's still uh, not that big uh, but if com- compared to some of the regional peers uh, it's on the higher end um and of this deficit uh, a little over a third two thirds accrues to the center and the rest is to the states now um just like the deficits i think the debt levels as well as we see uh, in the region are likely to go up here this year uh, because of uh, the pandemic related uh, you know impact uh, and closing out this slide with the ratings um rating wise the three global rating agencies are on par um, you know the ratings are on par for india uh, two of them have the, have india on negative outlook um the agencies have indicated you know taking a forward looking approach uh that they are looking for growth to return next year uh which along with some recovery um in revenues and some amount of fiscal consolidation uh, will help ease uh, debt levels so with this background um let me go on to slide 5 where we are in the second uh, part of the presentation which is the highlights of the domestic bond markets uh and where we will share some of the mechanics um on to slide 6 so we kick start with a regional comparison of the debt market you know in terms of its size uh, what you can see is that uh, in terms of the outstanding government bond markets uh, in the region uh, china is the largest um, and uh, followed uh, by india when we put the center and the state borrowings together uh, it's the second largest um, being a federal system you know like we you know like we shared at the right at the beginning both have their own budgets uh, and the center as well as the state issues bonds uh, so i'll provide an idea of the scale of these borrowings in the subsequent slide uh, but staying on to this one the central banker is essentially the banker as well as the debt manager for the government um, and as the debt manager uh, they manage public debt on behalf of the center as well as the states uh, now this also includes arriving um, at the borrowing program for the year after factoring in uh, what debt is maturing this year you know and then they take st- stake a st- stock of resources available um, and, and all that so uh, the central bank has a dual role uh, to play uh, in the domestic bond market um going on to slide 7 uh, now this is where we discuss the relative size of the outstanding issuance uh, now centers on the chart on the left the centers bonds uh, can be divided into dated as well as uh, treasury bills which are basically under 1 year Uh, in terms of its tenor uh, and there is also a third one called the cash management bills i mean those are uh, just short term instruments to meet the you know temporary mismatches uh, in the government's cash flows but here we stick with the dated as well as the t bills um, and what you see is that the outstanding t bills are roughly making up about 15% of the dated securities so in terms of the tenor breakdown most of the borrowings um, are in the you know 2 to you know 40 40 years kind of uh, tenors uh, not so much in so it's a small the shorter tenors papers are a small part of the issuance um, and this dated securities uh, at last check stood at about uh, you know inr 66 trillion so that would translate to about 880 billion in us dollar terms um the so chart on the right compares the government bonds basically that's the centers bonds uh and the 
state development bonds. So state development bonds are the bonds that are issued by respective states. Um, and what you see is that um, outstanding st- issuances by states are running at about half uh, the center's dated securities. Um, and as these SDLs, as we uh, it's commonly known, are typically less liquid um, and issued at a slight premium uh, to the center's, uh, you know, G- uh, GSEC as they're called, so GSEC uh, bond yields. On to slide um, eight. And now here we share the typical uh, investor mix for the centers as well as the state bonds. Uh, in India, the sovereign bond markets are dominated by domestic buyers, uh, which essentially make up your commercial banks, you know, primary dealers, mutual funds. Um, you also have insurance companies, provident funds, and so on, uh, which stands true for both the center as well as the state bonds. Um, and in the recent years, as we'll share in, in you know, going forward in the presentation, uh, the process of opening up the markets to more foreign portfolio investors is gaining traction. Uh, you know, uh, as of now, the ownership statistics are a bit lower than, uh, say, some of the ASEAN countries like Indo- Indonesia, or Malaysia, uh, but nonetheless. Uh, investors are gaining uh, uh, more of a foothold in the Indian bonds. Now, apart from the foreign portfolio investors, um, banks are also mandated to keep a certain proportion of their uh, net demand time liabilities. Now, that's commonly known as the NDTL. Now, uh, banks keep a proportion of that in form of liquid assets, uh, and this includes sovereign bond center as well as states. Um, so if I'd see the broad breakdown, you would see commercial banks um, holding about 40% of, of the outstanding issuance um, in the center's bonds. Then insurance companies are next because and then you have uh, some of the other domestic players uh, and the central bank uh, it also participate, uh, participates on, uh, on an ad hoc basis uh, in, the, in the domestic bond market. And in terms of the SDLs, which is the state development loans, it's the banks and the insurance companies, again, which is on the driver's seat, uh, they make about two thirds of the total, and they tend to keep um, a, a, at least insurance companies tend to keep these for longer duration and to maturity, um, given the nature nature of their business. Going on to slide nine, uh, we are in the third part, which is when we delve into uh, the foreign investors part of the story. So, you know how are markets opening up? Uh, domestic bond markets opening up uh, to the foreign investors. So let me start in uh, slide 10 with a bit of history now how this um, you know has evolved over the number of years. So we take a quick dive into the history. Um, now firstly, you know if we go back to the mid 90s, um, the allocation for the foreign portfolio investors between equities and debt used to be in a certain proportion, used to be 70 30 to mean that only 30 percent of the FI investment was allowed uh, into debt securities. As we move on, you see that gradually um, they allowed 100% of investments so, uh, into a unit. So initially it used to be a proportion and the debt investment had to stick to those those uh, proportions uh, uh, and that were highlighted. Thereafter, you'd seen that there was a special carve out um, for the debt investments. Uh, there was a unique category. Uh, so, which was then, you know, in that unique category, you basically investors could could invest 100% uh, of their investments. Uh, there was a certain, the overall cap was to begin with at uh, 1 billion um, with separate ca- caps for, um, you know, the, so you could, the investors would basically come into two routes. One, they could go through the proportion route, which is 70-30, or they could go down to the channel of the 100% uh, carve out debt equity, uh, debt investments alone. Um, and those were subject to, uh, you know, specific thresholds. Cumulatively, those thresholds stood at about a billion. Um, and thereafter, you'd seen more recently that the framework continued to be tweaked uh, over the since the um, late 2000s and now coming closer uh, to, to you know, 2018, 2019. Investment limits, what you've seen is that investment limits have been incrementally raised. Uh, some of that has been accompanied by residual limits. So investors who are... Uh, putting in money, uh, they were subject to some residual maturity requirements. Earlier it was five years, then it was cut down to three years. Um, and we, I, you know, one can say that if we see the past uh, three, four years particularly, more clarity is emerging um, because, uh, uh, you know, the authorities have um, brought, raised those investment limits uh, to attract more flows. Uh, and also there is a clearer roadmap 
that has been put into place as to you know how much more headroom uh, investors would have uh, and we certainly see that as a very progressive step while this is happening restrictions restrictions are also being um, gradually eased so let me go into some of the nuances uh, in slide 11 um as you can see on the chart on the left uh, is basically just in overview of how the limits have moved uh, like i mentioned in the mid uh, 90s these were the limits were extremely small and thereafter now you've seen that cumulatively um you know the limits have gone up so there are specific limits for the central bond uh, you know uh, central government securities that's the centers bonds and also the state bonds uh, what i've not included here is the corporate bonds uh, so those two um have uh, you know thresholds under which the investors could go ahead and invest uh, so for this slide i'll basically highlight three aspects um ab- about uh, foreign investments firstly i'll go with what kind of investors uh, now what kind of investors are basically classified on the basis of risks associated earlier they they used to be divided into three categories last year that was uh, simplified and made into two categories uh, category 1 which basically gives has um, uh, you know names like the university endowment funds so you have sovereign funds uh, funds from the um, uh, which have the approval of the fatf so that's basically the financial action task force and then you have category 2 which are entities uh, that are wanting to invest uh, but from non fatf uh, countries so those are the investors broadly divided into two categories um then in terms of the investment scope or size like uh, i just mentioned there are specific investment limits for foreign investors um and at currently it's cumulatively it stands at between 50 to uh, 60 bill, billions billion um and there on how much uh, of um, you know uh, the ownership is there you can see on the chart on the right we have just compared like i mentioned earlier some of the as compared to some of the asean members particularly indonesia and malaysia um you know india's uh, foreign ownership of gov- of uh, domestic debt is relatively smaller uh, but nonetheless that headroom is being increased uh, successfully uh, successively in in recent years and lastly what's new uh, in this space so um you know just as the threshold is being raised uh, restrictions are also being eased there are few avenues by which um, new investors could uh, could get a piece of the uh, debt buy so if uh, let me highlight a few here firstly it's the voluntary retention route basically known as the vrr so this is a special avenue for investors who can commit investments for a certain period of time i mean right now it's at about 3 years if they are able to commit um, investments uh, then they do enjoy lower uh, macro prudential as well as regulatory requirements so it makes it much easier for them to uh, you know choose the kind of um, uh, uh, investment products that they want to go into uh, provided they can hold the funds um, for the predetermined time the secondly is the far so that's the fully accessible route and now under these investments uh, the government uh, i mean this government as well as the central bank continue to carve out specified securities which basically are not subject to any limits uh, for foreign investors right so um, and in this category are there are some existing securities that have been highlighted um, um, by the central bank new issue of 5 10 and 30 year tenors um starting you know the fiscal uh, fiscal year fy21 that is the year that um, is ongoing and will last till march to the 2021 all these will be eligible for investors under the far uh, so they you know essentially not subject to any limits and beyond this uh, there's also been specified that as the years go on new tenors um or new kind of securities might also be uh, designated as um, you know eligible for the far route uh, as we go Uh, over the next few years and the third uh, is a, glo- a global bond index inclusion and now uh, inclusion of uh, so india's bonds are right now off the index uh, so th- there are plans um, uh, to get uh, the in- the indian bond some representation in the jp bond index as well as, as, well as the bloomberg barclays uh, index uh, we had written a paper on it uh, earlier this year uh, which can be found um, in the research section uh, of the dbs research website uh, so the india right now is the largest off index bond market uh, but this you know inclusion as and when it occurs is potentially increase uh, further sticky flows and you can also see a lot of uh, passive uh, passive fund interest um, heading into the domestic bond market so these are some of the new initiatives that have been that have been made more recently
Um, so thereon, we move to the, um, you know, that was a bit of a backdrop about the bond markets. Let me now discuss quickly what, has, what is driving the INR, uh, you know, government bond yields currently. So what are the current dynamics? In slide 13, what you do see is that um, this year, the, the India's yield curve uh, is currently quite steep. So the short end has been held down by the central bank's, um, uh, you know, aggressive rate cuts. They have uh, taken about 115 basis point worth of cuts so far this year. At the same time, a lot of liquidity has been provided and there's a little investor appetite and that has really held down the short end of the curve. Uh, by the long end, um, that was held up because of concerns over, you know, the bond supply, because um, uh, you are because of higher fiscal deficit this year borrowings will also go up uh, as well as um, you know uh, fiscal growth slippage in general so that had held up um, the long end what we see now is that from the central bank there is very directed um, action on trying to correct the steepness in the INR curve um, so apart from taking a policy perspective which is basically cutting rates the central bank has also gone down non-conventional tools essentially firstly to make sure that there is ample liquidity in the domestic uh, banking system uh, so banking system unlike past years when it has been close to neutral or deficit this year has been in a strong surplus this essentially allows the policy transmission to happen uh, to the uh, public bond space as well as the private uh, bond markets as well so it keeps uh, helps to anchor uh, you know borrowing costs in general in slide 14 i just delve into uh, the specifics that have been done by the central bank so let, let me just continue with that so in apart from keeping liquidity flush uh, what the central bank has also done is that they have given extremely dovish guidance guidance uh, to anchor rates They've, at the latest meeting in october uh, they did mention that they do want to keep these stands accommodative for this year as well as going into FI 22 or calendar year 2021. Uh, so the central bank has thereafter also had a, a combination of, um, you know, the liquidity neutral operation twist um, and where, you know, the short end is sold and the long end is bought. They've done that as well as secondary market purchases uh, under the open market operation system. More recently, they've said, you know, that activity used to be very, um, uh, it used to happen primarily in the center's uh, bonds. Uh, the most recent decision is also that they would look at providing support also to the states, state bond markets as well. So that's where the central bank has provided uh, some kind of support uh, for the domestic bond market. And that is really he uh, helping uh, to correct that steepness in the curve. So you have seen the longer tenor, particularly the 10-year yields, um, uh, you know, gradually uh, drift lower in the past uh, 10 days or so. Uh, and then you also have these cheap financing windows uh, that the banks have been provided with, which with they redirect those funds into corporate as well as non-bank credits. So again, the idea is to anchor the mainstream rates, the bond yields, which then hopefully with the percolate uh, down to the private sector borrowing costs as well. Uh, while the central bank has been active, you've also seen the banks, commercial banks domestically uh, keep up a, a, in a very active role. Um, as you can see in the chart on the right, the red line essentially is the statutory liquidity ratio. This essentially is the mandated level of liquid assets that the banks need to maintain, where they, then they usually channel that into the bond market. And that has been uh, going up quite steadily. At this point, the SLR is perhaps about 10% more than where the mandated levels are uh, as a percentage of NDTL. So what this means is that the banks have also uh, been borrowed because uh, the mainstream business, which is basically credit growth, has also been tepid while deposits have been going up. So they've also find, found the bond market to be a route uh, to uh, to put a, to redirect some of that uh, flush funds or liquidity that they have. Um, so it, these cumulatively, from domestic players' perspective, has, has helped uh, to temper as well as uh, to the longer end of the bond yield curve. Uh, so with this, I will, I think, wrap up the bond market part of the section and let me quickly go uh, in, in into the external balances which i will then tie to the rupee part of the story uh, so in slide 16 
um, you know, this year has been the pandemic has really changed um, India's external balances. Uh, uh, as you can see in slide 16, the chart on the left is the big one of the biggest telltale signs have just been the current account uh, dynamics. So in the current account, we, India typically runs uh, deficits. Uh, you know, it had been narrowing. It had been under 2% of GDP in the past few years. Uh, we are at, at, at this point now when uh, India is going to um, print perhaps a current account surplus. Uh, our own estimates are it's possible for, for an above 1% of GDP surplus, current account surplus this year. Um, that is essentially because even though exports are showing signs of recovery, uh, imports have really uh, fallen quite sharply. So you've seen uh, net net that the um, current account is surplus is then feeding into the balance of payment uh, surplus as well. Uh, so as the surplus has grown, uh, you're basically seeing on the other end uh, of the financing is that the reliance on uh, debt creating portfolio flows has gone down. Typically, when the deficits are run, you would look for, you know, you need portfolio investors or FDI investments to come in to balance uh, the deficit. But this year, because we're going to see a net surplus and there are flows, portfolio flows also coming in primarily to the equity markets, uh, you'll see net net there is dollar surplus uh, in the system. So external balances on the current account front uh, is, is looking good. At the same time, you've got the reserves that are also climbing quite strongly. Uh, in the chart on the right, I've just made a comparison between India as well as some of the region, vis-a-vis some of the regional countries. And what you see is since the 2013 taper tantrum, uh, the uh, India's reserves have has risen by the most. Um, I, I know, and that continues to be a priority uh, because uh, a, a, with a view on on curbing volatility and also building a cushion against external balances, uh, external uncertainties, uh, the central bank has been pretty keen to keep a good bif- buffer in place. So that continues to be a priority uh, for the central bank. Um, so I will tie that in with the rupee view um, in the, uh, slide uh, 18. Before I go into the current dynamics of uh, the currency, let me just delve into a bit of the you know, backdrop. So we did start off with laying the ground for the bond markets. Let me lay the ground for the Indian rupee as well. Uh, firstly, rupee trading and the fixing mechanism. Uh, so this is slide 18. You know, FX trading has really come a long way. Uh, you know, until the early 90s, this is basically the pre-reform period, what you had seen that anyone who's willing to transact in a foreign currency had to really approach uh, the central bank. You know, regardless of what purpose you were taking it for, it used to be at a predetermined uh, rate, uh, which is basically finalized by the central bank. So from those times, we have really uh, made a long push to where we are at this point. Of course, the 1991 liberalization helped. Um, and uh, you had seen that uh, forest transactions have become more and more uh, open uh, these 90s period. Uh, more recently, in terms of the uh, you know, fixing mechanism, you've seen in 2018 that the FBIL, so that's the Financial Benchmarks India Private Limited, uh, took over this responsibility of uh, coming up with the rupee fixing. Uh, he took it over from the RBI. So now the FBIL is responsible for computation as well as dissemination of this reference rate. Uh, now these these reference rates are basically published every day uh, using the transaction level uh, data. And um, so apart from the trading and the fixing mechanism, I mean, the kind of onshore products that one can trade in includes uh, spots, forwards, uh, auction, options, as well as cross-current currency uh, rate swaps. Um, Thereafter, uh, a bit more details, plans to, you know, you, there are plans to make the rupee capital account convertible. Uh, that is under study. So at this instance, rupee is current account convertible uh, since about 1993. What that means is that, you know, there is freedom to convert the currency into foreign currency. Um, and, and vis-a-vis, if you, one is trading in, in goods and invisibles. Uh, so they could go down, I mean, approach uh, the foreign market or foreign exchange participants uh, and get the foreign exchange in return. Uh, the next step would be to make a currency capital account convertible. Basically, that just means it's there's complete freedom in converting the domestic currency to other global currencies and vis-a-vis. And that's and market determined exchange rates. Um, so that is under study. Um, and it has not gone down that uh, that uh, capital account convertibility path as, as yet. Um, at the same time, uh, the final part of this slide is that there is uh, so right now because the Indian rupee is not uh, 
traded freely across borders. You do have um, the Indian rupee NDF version, which is, which is basically the non-deliverable forwards uh, that's actively traded in the offshore markets. So this would be in the markets of like London, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, the authorities have been keen to bridge, you know, the gap between higher volume of rupee trading in the offshore markets. They want to bridge that with the onshore markets. So there is there is um, uh, a considerable effort going into in this direction. Now towards this uh, this year, you had seen Indian banks with licenses were allowed to operate um, in the western part of the country uh, under this IFSC. So that's the International Financial Services Center. So they could put up branches there and participate in the NDF market. Uh, so this is a part of the attempt to bring though you know. Uh, hopefully rechannel part of the offshore trading, bring it on to uh, onshore. And if that really bears fruit, you what you would see is that it this will basically narrow the arbitrage between the offshore and the onshore markets for the rupee, um, hopefully lead to better price discovery uh, as well as lower hedging costs um, for, for the players in, in the FX markets. Uh, so with this, I will go into uh, slide number 19 where uh, uh, touch upon the current dynamics of the currency markets for the rupee uh, and in slide 19 what you see is that after very tumultuous year the rupee has been largely stable this year a bit weaker still as so you can see on the chart on the left uh, that's the line in red uh, and again I've compared it with some of the other EM currencies and what you see is that the rupee has been largely stable earlier this year there was a bout of weakness again not as weak as some of the other uh, regional currencies um, or the EM currencies, if you take, you know, the uh, Brazilian real or if you take the Indonesian rupiah, they did come under much more pressure. Uh, rupee was weakened a bit and thereafter it's part back. But in the past couple of months, it's been largely stable. Um, and what is behind this, um, you know, stable um, outlook is basically what are the key, you know, if you look at the, some of the key determinants of the rupee, at least external drivers are essentially capital flows. U.S. rates and the dollar direction. And in this respect, uh, the chart on the right tells you um, uh, that this year we are looking at a net surplus, net dollar surplus in the system. There is flows coming in, um, primarily into the equity markets, uh, a bit into the debt markets. At the same time, the current account is in net surplus. So these two are really adding to um, the, the debt dollar um, you know, uh, surplus in the system. Uh, at the same time, the U.S. rates are extremely low and U.S. dollar has been largely stable to weaker this year. Uh, so these three fa fa factors put together are uh, certainly positive for the currency. Uh, at the same time, there is also these uh, domestic uh, biases. right? So on the domestic end, what you have seen is that the official bias for the central bank is to keep volatility low. So the, though there is a dollar surplus in the system, uh, they have... They prefer to absorb some of the portfolio flows or hot money flows uh, on a regular basis. Uh, this is basically just uh, to keep the current volatility low, keep the currency stable and to prevent um, any one-sided swings uh, in the currency. So uh, that is pretty much determined what uh, mix of domestic as well as uh, global factors that is that is leaving the rupee where it is at this point. In the slide number 20 is our uh, in-house um, you know, forecast for this year. Um, we conclude by in how, you know, providing some inputs on this and on our, um, our FX strategist does uh, highlight that in the past two decades or so, most of the years that the currency has ended positive are the years when the dollar has been on a weaker uh, you know, bias. Uh, so going into 2021, what do we make of um, the different drivers? Uh, we do think we do expect the dollar rupee to be on a modestly depreciating bias. Um, heading towards levels of 76, 77. Uh, and why would that be the case? Essentially, because you're going to see a return. Uh, so what we see now is the current account uh, surplus is somewhat a reflection of weaker domestic demand. Going into 2021, we think some of that could reverse out. We could uh, enter the current account deficit part of uh, the spectrum, but again, very small deficits, uh, but we do think some of that surplus will, will narrow. We'll head into deficits. Apart from that, you'll also see the central bank, uh, like we highlighted earlier, they continue to provide uh, prioritize reserves accumulation. Uh, so both these factors, we think, will keep the dollar rupee, um, apart from the dollar broader dollar view, these factors will keep the dollar rupee on a gradually, um, you know, uh, upward bias going into 2021. I think with this, I will conclude um, and uh, pass it back to Temur.
Thank you very much, Radhika. Very comprehensive and very interesting times for foreign investors to invest in India. Uh, and uh, as we have seen in recent years, both foreign direct investment and portfolio investment, particularly on the equity side on the portfolio investment route, have been uh, quite buoyant in India despite the challenging macroeconomic landscape. Radhika, my first question to you is that if I am a buy side investor sitting somewhere in the West or in East Asia, looking at asset allocation, uh, would I consider India an easier place to invest than, say, some other Southeast Asian counterparts, or is it uh, still a little more challenging? Um, um, you, uh, you know, the Indian um, domestic debt markets have been gradually opening up to the foreign investors, uh, more and more so in the past few years, uh, because there is a general recognition that um, higher foreign debt can also have foreign investors, um, uh, not only by way of... Uh, so right now, the, the investments are subject to a uh, threshold. Uh, the cap is about you know 50 to 60 billion put together for the center as well as the state bonds. Uh, so if we compare, say, against Indonesia, uh, there, there are no limits uh, and the ownership levels of foreign investors is much higher in the domestic debt market. So I would think the market would be more open uh, to allowing investors in. Uh, in India's case, um, there is a threshold to uh, or investment limit to adhere to. Uh, nonetheless, the bond markets are much more stable. Um, and uh, that, that's why I would think that uh, certain looking to get a piece of the domestic bond market pie would be keen. So to some extent, you are, uh, you know, balancing openness of the debt markets to stability, and in that, uh, from that, in that respect, I would think the Indian bond markets uh, would score well. Right, uh, and what about the FX market? I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, narrowing the gap between the offshore and onshore market, uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, NDF trade is frowned upon. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there is a parallel market, so to speak. So which is which is the NDF market. Uh, the um, onshore authorities are certainly looking at it very closely, particularly in instances when uh, there could be very visible, uh, you know, uh, investors taking arbitrage between the two markets, or that external influences then spill over to the domestic markets as well. And I think that's why there is uh, we've also seen volumes pick up quite sharply, sharply uh, offshore. Um, hence, the central bank um, and the other regulators are keen to redirect some of that, um, you know, onshore. It basically helps because uh, it it brings in uh, less volatility, uh, which basically helps uh, corporates uh, or any of the other players to hedge their costs. So, I think in all, it's it's a win win. Um, if you do see, so at this point, it's certainly um, any of if you want to exchange. Um, you know, or most of the offshore investors would tend to go to the NDF market, but I would think give take another five to ten years, you would see some of those interests uh, return to the onshore markets. So, Radhika, I mean, of course, you know, there are some investors who would use the NDF market to speculate on the rupee, but then there is also you know genuine demand for hedging. And speaking of hedging, there is also on the bond side, uh, investors like to find some sort of a way to hedge their exposure by taking position on the credit default swap of a country, for example. But my understanding is that the sovereign of India, because it doesn't have any hard currency dollar issuance, it doesn't actually have a CDS. So how does invest? How, how would an investor deal with this issue? Uh, so certainly, you know, credit default swaps, essentially, these are um, uh, some form of insurance against credit risks right, against, you know, say, specific entities or asset class. Now, since this framework, so uh, India does have one um uh, you know this these kind of products now uh, these are efforts to basically develop and deepen the cds market have been ongoing so last year's budget for instance had outlined plans for the government uh, to work with the central bank and other securities to streamline this initiative but uh, at, as of now i think the volumes are quite thin and the trading interests are not that high uh, so and i think part of that is because there are few sub regulations uh, which basically have uh, made it expensive for the players for the entities as well the market makers uh, to operate in this market. So right now, I think investors typically use, uh, uh, say, the SBI CDS as a proxy for the sovereign. Uh, but I would think, again, these uh, this is one of those avenues where the uh, uh, government does want to, or government as well as the other regulators, does want to deepen um, the CDS market. And like you rightly mentioned, to provide some kind of hedge um, uh, against these, these risks, against credit risks in particular. Right. So the interesting thing is that when you look at India's equity market in dollar terms, uh, although we still see massive global investor interest in them, 
the returns, at least in the last 10 years, has actually not been that great, particularly because of the rupees depreciation. Conversely, if you look at the bond market, which everybody thinks of as you know a boring place, is actually the where where you know the yields have been strong, and in terms of real yields, at least in the recent past, India has de- delivered uh, uh, good returns. So, Radhika, we will keep an eye on this, and I believe that your primer will also be available on the website and would be subject to periodic updates, uh, which makes sense given that rules and regulations are evolving in India, and investors need to keep up. So, we will help them do that. Uh, we also would urge the readers to read your primer publication, which of course will con- contain far greater detail than what could be uh, presented in this webinar. So thank you very much, Radhika, uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, for our listeners, thank you for your time. Uh, the AJ Economics webinar was produced by Martin Taki. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendation. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.